Just waiting for a signal to get started here. Okay, we are on. Uh, the Toronto Film Festival couldn't be more ecstatic to, to have shown this film for our opening night. I think it was one of the liveliest uh, uh, nights ever at, at the festival. Um, but for you guys, you were seeing it for the first time with an audience uh, yourself. What was that like, going through this again with an audience? It's, it's always excruciating to, to talk about yourself and to see yourself talking about yourself is kind of even worse. But um, I thought Davis did an incredible job with what could have been a subject matter that might have been kind of for train spotter type fans only. I think he made it something that was accessible for film lovers and, and it, I, I certainly was very happy with how it worked out. I rather like talking about myself. Um, uh, Singer. <laughs> no, it, 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 is, it is excruciating. Um, and you just hope that it serves a purpose and, and that that purpose um, might be that, uh, you know, that the film, um, if you're interested in the sort of rock band era and, uh, one of the bands of that era and how they, it operates, how four people can work together. Because they don't, you know, painters, you don't get four people hanging out together, or poets or novelists or, and it's a strange thing um, to be artists and, and, you know, to collaborate together and it's produced some interesting bands. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to hold together. I think maybe that's, that's what this, this f film's about. Um, by the way, Tom, I would like to say that I think, you know, that the festival, one of the reasons that it has such respect the world over is because you keep taking risks. I, I was scratching my head w when I heard that you were going to give a documentary, a gala opening, and and I, I just, I think, I just, we would like, as subjects of the film, and I know Davis feels like this as, as director, to thank you for, for that unusual choice. So thank you. Well, we had 35 years of made-up stories. Now the next 35 can be documentaries. <clears throat> Uh, Davis, uh, can you talk about the, the experience of watching with the audience? I mean, there's always something different that comes out of the audience than sitting in your uh, uh, edit room by yourself. It's interesting. You don't, sometimes you don't know what your movie's about until after it's done. That, you know, it's, it's falling from the sky down in a lot of ways. And uh, it made me reflect. You know, the, the, one of the unspoken sort of heroes of the movie is um, Brian Eno, when he talks at the beginning and the end of the movie about what a clan is. And to see these guys not as rock stars, but as a band of brothers, and what is unique about these four men that made them endure. And weirdly, uh, it made me think about my own marriage, that, the, that, the, the, that, the, that the, the way to stay together, that these guys have this, you know, how have these guys endured? You, when you think of a great marriage, and you say, how, did that, how does that work? How do these guys stay alive together in this thing that the, the law of physics seems to pull against you. <laughs> and um, so, you know, and brutal honesty, the things we talked about, the brutal honesty, you know, commitment to a bigger idea despite the fact that the world is pulling against you. So that's, that, when, I, when I watched the movie last night, I was like, oh, that's what it's about. Do you have three spouses? <laughs> uh, well, I was going to say, a marriage of two is, is, must be easier than a marriage of four. <laughs> That's why you're registered in Utah. Um, um, look, it's a very, it's also a particularly male uh, problem. Um, men, as they get older, uh, tend to rid the room of argument. And I think probably particularly men who, who feel they've achieved something in their life um, don't normally 
court um, a, a relationship where where somebody is going to um, be able to tell you to fuck off um, on a daily basis. You know, you have your pride, you've achieved something. Why, do, why would you need this? And it's a very good question. And, and um, you know, it's like the, the male ego gets sort of calcified and brittle. Um, and, and yet, if you can get through it, it's quite an efficient organism, the band. And, and it's a real band. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the difference. And um, I was reading an article about uh, plane crashes and how you're much better off if the co-pilot is flying your plane because the pilot will always, the captain will always interrupt the co-pilot and contradict him and say, no, you're doing something wrong, that's wrong. But the other way around doesn't happen in some situations. The co-pilot is scared to question the captain and you can get into problems. I think our band operates on the basis that anyone can question anyone and that there's no demarcation. There's no, that's my area, don't criticize me in this regard. And that keeps it honest and healthy. I think that clarify that that means that my wife has to listen to me now. <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> Well, kind of building on that, uh, we, we got a tweeted question from Jane Stevenson at uh, the Toronto Sun. Uh, she said, uh, you don't like looking back, but what did the process of making the film show you in terms of, of your creative process? I think um, taking risks for us always seems to become a fruitful thing. And um, w that's the way we, we operate generally anyway, but it was never more evident than on this particular project that uh, playing it safe is the scariest thing that we could ever consider. And the, the riskier, it seems, the better in terms of the results for us. Uh, I, I did, I, I found it very, uh, a little humiliating um, to realize that we, were so inept, and n these days we're a better band. We've learned our craft, and therein lies a huge danger, which is there's a giant chasm between the very good and the great. And you two right now has a danger of surrendering to the very good. In those times, 20 years ago and indeed before that, we were crap and great. It wasn't much very good. And, and I think that it, I was just reminded of how crap we were watching film, and I, was, if I just found it really awful. A and yet, <clears throat> it was a self-imposed crapness. <laughs> like we were doing, we were trying to make music that we didn't understand. And the band seems to do its best work when it's in that environment. And when it gets comfortable, it, 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 it's not as interesting. And so there may be some more crap coming up <laughs> as you try to... You know. Who are some of the other musicians and bands that you look to as people who have had careers of longevity and reinvention and meaningfulness throughout their career? I, I, I just... I just would have loved to have seen The Clash now. Um, some, some bands, their, their kind of modus is, is wrapped up in adolescence and, and it's, it's youthful music. But The Clash, you know, they were interested in blue beat and ska and jazz and rockabilly and all kind of punk rock, lots of things. And I just would have loved to have seen Joe Strummer and that whole original lineup, Mick Jones, Paul Simone, 
um, Terry on the drums. Uh, or I think about the Beatles like that, you know. I think that would have been just r remarkable. Um, um, and the Beatles, are, of course, are the blueprint for any band. And not just uh, m musically, but there's a thing about uh, this film, which is why we, we, we went to Berlin, because we were sort of interested in what you might call the zeitgeist. We always are. It's a German word, but it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's we all understand what it means, and it's the forces that shape the world are, you know, they can be from all sides, cultural, political, spiritual, tech, science, uh, um, and, and we always tend to want to be where it's at. We're curious in all these things. It's not just going to be cultural, and the Beatles were like that. So you have them going to India to, you know, to, to study with the Maharishi and look, look in that. They formed Apple Records. They got into commerce. They were experimenting in lots of different directions. And I know that that's trying sometimes for our audience and for some people when they see us go off piste, so to speak. And, um, but I think that's part of what we, we do. And I like... I think bands with longevity are the ones that ha have that sort of I I curiosity in the world. I think of Miles Davis because um, not only did he Great go band. through so many different phases and, and altered the course of jazz and music, but um, we, we met John McLaughlin recently for the first time and of course we were asking him for any stories of, of working with Miles and he hinted that Miles would sometimes be in the studio without necessarily really knowing what he was going to try and do, which was kind of reassuring for us because clearly, having watched this film, you, you, you notice we do that, that too. Um, and I think why he would do that, and, and certainly why we do it, is, is to get yourself out of the comfort zone, find yourself in a place where you have to be resourceful and creative because there's no other choice. And if you are in a comfortable place where you can rely on craft, previous lessons learned, inevitably that's the music you'll create, a, a comfortable sound. And we've just no interest in going there. It's, it's the least interesting thing for us. We got a tweeted question from Peter Howell uh, from the Toronto Star. He wanted to know, if there is one movie and one album that you'd recommend to new filmmakers and musicians to hear? A music? An album and a film. Two, two. I think Torches by uh, Foster the People is a very interesting new album. Very um, 21st century pop, but it's beautifully made and thrilling in a, in a, in a way. Yeah, I should say, he wasn't actually specifying a new album. He was talking about for, for new up-and-coming filmmakers oh, and musicians. So. A classic. A classi okay. Well, still, Torches. <laughs> it's pretty great. See, we're always interested in the new thing in some ways because uh, as a guitar player particularly, the, it's always, it, it seems to me, the, the, the guy who's just picked it up for the first time is learning the instrument that might stumble upon some new angle. And I'm always fascinated to see where it's about to go. It's a great album, and it's great because it's, it's a sort of act of defiance in very tough times for a lot of people. Canada is having a, a, a good run for the moment, but back home in, in Ireland and in the UK and uh, uh, south of the border, it's, it, there's tough times. So seeing you know, those melodies that are that are that brightly colored, that have joy as opposed to happiness. That's, that, that's great. For me, a seminal album for us would have been Patti Smith's Horses. Um, and the, that, that, if you're talking about brutal honesty, um, um, that opening line, Jesus died for somebody else's sins but not mine. When I was 16, I was like, I do not know what this woman is on about, but I better find out. And and just that sort of sprawling um, quest of hers, uh, the, she, 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 her as, as a pilgrim is something that I, I have found great. I would always recommend. What about films? Um, 
It might get louder as it's, it's, it's a documentary Davis has made on folk music. Um, you got to do that. <laughs> it might get louder. Sorry. Uh, I, I have a, um, a Twitter one. May I try a Twitter one? From Tara Pratt. Who enjoyed dressing in drag the most? Bono. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, what's interesting is Larry, uh, who really didn't like the idea, uh, looked like he's in some skin flick. Um, uh, Edge took to us with the sort of with the perfectionist's eye and ended up. Um, I like just it. freaked myself out because I looked so much like my sister. Yeah. Was just, <laughs> I was like shocked. Um, Adam uh, looked like the Queen of England, and I look like Barbara Bush. <laughs> uh, here's one about um, the Trabants. Anyone keep a Trabant in the garage uh, in Ireland, just for good times? A very small one. Small, small. small one, no, unfortunately. But we that have them in storage. In fact, some of them are at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. They're, um, we painted them up for the tour. Some were covered in mirrored squares. Some were covered in fur. Um, we did a sort of Klaus Oldenburg um, pop art thing with them, and um, they became really a big part of the tour iconography. That what last one was from Dean Cooper. Uh, this is from Crystal Foreman. What is even better than the real thing? Is there anything that isn't finished on the, sorry. What is even better than the real thing? Is there anything that isn't finished on the album? On That's from Crystal Foreman. On, on Acting Baby or on? Maybe read that. I'm not a good reader. I mean, the thing about this band is we don't really finish an album. It just gets released. And so there's pretty much every single song that we've ever released we would probably want to change in some some ways, some profound ways in, in some cases. But we always get the chance when we play live to adjust things and change things around. You, know, you shouldn't really explain um, titles. Even better than the real thing is a sort of a pop art um, thought. Um, but uh, as I'm looking at it now, I'm thinking of uh, Woody Allen's line, there's no such thing as bad sex. And um, I think the carnality of it is, is, was an important part of, our, of what was going on in that album. Has everyone seen the Damien Hirst video from, that he made for the song? Yeah, he made a very special artwork, which was only been shown once and will probably not be shown again, but it, it, at Glastonbury, um, the UK um, festival. And it's, it's an extraordinary work of art. He's an extraordinary artist. And, um, <clears throat> and he, he really went at it. But you know, these, sometimes these words or these thoughts, they, just, they become just kind of meditations. And, and you'll never fully understand them, but you feel them, you know. Um, is there anything that isn't finished on the album? There, there, there's a uh, thing that's happened, the Q magazine, which is a uh, very important uh, music um, magazine in, in, in the UK. They have commissioned uh, various artists to do a, a song of On Acton Baby to come out in, in, the, in the fall. And there's some extraordinary versions. Um, Jack White does Love Is Blindness. Depeche Mode do You're So Cruel. Um, Paddy Smith, who we were just talking about, did um, Until the End of the World. Uh, Damien Rice does one. I mean, it just goes on. There's just a list of incredible artists. And it's strange because when I hear the album, when you two do it, I th I, all I hear is what's wrong with it. But when I heard all these artists doing it, I thought, that's really good. Um, so. Have you ever set, d finished a song and say, I really like that? Miss Sarajevo is the one that when I hear come on the radio, I don't cringe. And maybe because that's very... That it? <laughs> uh, one. <laughs> oh. uh, uh, I, and I like if I'm out, yeah. 
And, you know, it, there's nothing worse than being out in a club and somebody puts on one of your tunes. It's like, oh, it's just having a good time. And, <laughs> uh, but if Vertigo comes on in a club, I actually... It's okay. I think, whoa, that's okay. That's good, because in the old days it used to be something like New Year's Day or Sunday Bloody Sunday, yeah. which, which is fine, but if you happen to be on the dance floor, it's kind of embarrassing when they play your song and then everyone leaves the dance floor because they can't dance to it. That's happened a few times. Davis, can I ask you a question about the making of this film? The, um, in making a documentary, there's always kind of a period of breaking the ice with the, the subjects and kind of you know getting through. So they, there's this feeling of trust between. Can you talk about that experience of breaking the ice with with these guys? I, I can't wait for it to happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I, I think it really helped that. that uh, Edge and I work together on it might get loud. I think no matter what documentary or, or movie you make, it's a it's it's a relationship that 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 just takes time. And um, uh, I think these in, I, I've been doing something different uh, where I just do these interviews, uh, just me and the subject. We, I interviewed each member of the band separately, just sound only. Uh, alone with with sort of no time limit, and we and it would just be a conversation, and some of that is just getting to know each other, and some of it's uh, they have a wandering nature to them. There's, I have no zero um, plan for them, and it allows a conversation to start and a and a, a relationship to 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 begin, and 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 that. But it's still it's still a process. I mean, last night was a was another step in the in, in the relationship, because we it's it's still it's still like there's something there's something adversarial about making a movie about something that's that you don't know neither side wants, but it is naturally there. Oh, it absolutely is. Um, it 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 absolutely is, and I'm still trying to figure it out how we l let him in um, uh, to the level that we, that, that we did. And it's very interesting because we are, as a band, v very, uh, very protective and, and aggressive. Well, for um, good reason, I think, because uh, when, when working with people who have great intentions but maybe don't quite have the rigor of, of a filmmaker like Davis, you can, you can be completely misrepresented w with, w with a, a project. And for me, when Davis agreed to do this, I felt I could relax because I knew that the thing that he was most interested in was actually the truth as opposed to what was a great shot or, you know, what he th what might kind of be uh, sensational. And uh, so he was very rigorous with us in the interviews. You know, if, if we were not kind of in the moment, if we were being self-conscious, he would change the subject. Because he knew, he could tell when we were speaking without being in any way aware of the situation or, or what was going on, the process. And so the stuff that's ended up in the film are those moments where, where we're really being honest, where we're unguarded. A little and bit of a sensationalism would have been good. A uh, <laughs> few great shots. Um, um, I, I just couldn't, I felt like I was mugged. Um, and that I, and what really annoyed me was I didn't know I was being mugged because of the way he carries himself. Um, More pickpocketed. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, it, was, it was, it was sleight of hand, and, and I'm I'd be used to the, you know, having the fight, bit of arm wrestling, all of that, but I just felt like I ended up in the trunk, bound and gagged. I saw this film, Two Rough Cuts, um, the first time I was like, 
Oh gosh, I know this is this is great, but I have to see it again t to see how I, f I feel about it. Second time I saw it, I really didn't like it. Um, he didn't change a thing, and uh, there was things that he was unhappy with. He changed. I think if they were, uh, you know, I'm, I think I made two comments. I don't know, three, you know, but. Uh, Lead singers are not great at being ignored, and, <laughs> and, uh, and, but it was, I'm really glad now, I actually nearly enjoyed it last night, and I think because I could see that, I thought it would be very indulgent, I thought it would be a little solip, well it is solipsism, but, but actually more importantly, this thing of wanting to unearth what it is, that it, the, 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 the creative process seemed to be of interest to the audience and they were along for it. And I was like, oh, wow. So I was quite relieved. But, but he, he is a, he's a remarkable filmmaker because he, his ego is the, the thing that he is prepared to put aside for the project he's working on. And so you have to put yours aside, too. You talked last night on stage about <clears throat> this being like watching sausages get made. But as people were coming out of the theater, I think they felt like it made the sausages more tasty. They, it gave them a, a better, bigger appetite to go back and, and try those sausages uh, again. That's what my wife said, anyways. <clears throat> That's great. Um, uh, Davis, uh, you talked about doing these audio interviews uh, with them, which which come out in the film and you know sometimes we know who's talking and sometimes we don't. It's almost like it's a collective voice of this uh, uh, organism. Um, uh, I, I say all the smart things, that's how you know. <laughs> that's true always. <laughs> Can you talk about that, uh, the, the, the idea be behind the, the, the way those voices are used in the film? Well, I think it, it's, it's um, actually showing you the rough cut was similar to showing Al Gore the rough cut of Inconvenient Truth. That, that there's, I mean, you've had your life in the media, you know, since you were, when we were 17 and 18, trying to figure out who we are, these guys were, were being talked about and questioned and up until now. Uh, and that's true with um, a politician. And so there's a sort of an extra on guardness. But the, the other part about it is, is that the audience starts the movie with a relationship with these guys. Everyone who came into the movie last night uh, had, had, was bringing the first chapter of the story to the movie. And so the movie has to <laughs> fight against that baggage that people bring in, that the audience brings in. Um, and so these, these audio interviews are an attempt to, um, it w w interesting, what's, what's effective is taking you off camera uh, and keeping those interviews very um, stripped down and very raw and unselfconscious, um, so that, so it, so that over. In fact, the first on person on camera is Eno, I believe, and it's a good 20 minutes in, and that's intentional. So that so the audience has a feet. <laughs> when you talk about writing, it goes from the feeling of these characters, as opposed to you know the idea of these characters. And it's, so it is weirdly, you know, a kind of, you, we, like you start your song from a feeling and an impression. The movie has to start that way too. To fight against, I think, what people are bringing into the movie. This movie get, joins a long tradition of, of music documentaries. You can go back to the 1960s, the films like Don't Look Back and Gimme Shelter. And, I wonder if there are, you know, films like that or, or other insights into the, into the making of, of other bands' music that, that you've learned from or in the same way that fans approach this film and, and learn something new about your creative process. Have you learned things about other people's creative process? The Last Waltz. Martin Scorsese's The Last Waltz. I've seen it ten times. Um, that, that's, I would recommend that for anyone that's... That was a real in insight into a band, actually. Um, and then they, they really did, they, that was the end of it. Um, it was them at their peak, and then they were gone. What about you? 
Um, don't look back. The Dylan film is is such a, an incredible piece of work because it captures a moment in his career where he decided to turn his back on the folk scene, which had been uh, he'd been the king of. So he effectively walked away from one fiefdom to, uh, to sort of go and seek his fortune elsewhere. And that's kind of for us a, a great lesson again if, of somebody who does not want to be pigeonholed, is prepared to sacrifice a lot to, to move forward. And of course, now we can look back and go, well, of course, that was the thing to do. And he made all those great records with the band and whatever. But at the time, I'm sure he wasn't sure you know, where it was going to go and whether it was the end of his real success. And whether, it, But he made that decision to just go for it. And I think uh, we would certainly be inspired by that. Tom, have you, have you seen uh, the Neil Young Documentary that's I coming in. Neil Young documentary. Yeah. Of course you did. Um, um, yeah, I mean, he's I he's. I say which one? We're showing one here at the festival. The, Jonathan Demi has a new Neil Young documentary called Neil Young Journeys. So oh, this is the this, this is the third uh, collaboration that Jonathan has done uh, with Neil Young, and this new one is a concert film filmed here in Toronto at Massey Hall just in May. This film was made faster than your film. Um, oh. uh, uh, and uh, extraordinary um, uh, concert, a solo show that he performed here. He, he's a, a sacred talent. Uh, li listening to his music, you, you do feel like you should take your shoes off a little bit. Um, so I'm, I don't think we can stay until Monday, but I really um, would love to see that. Jonathan Demme is an incredible filmmaker. Mm -hmm. I remember the, the impact of Stop Making Sense uh, was had a huge impact on us too, and I know, for instance, Arcade Fire, the same. They were it had a, it had a huge impact on them. Stop making sense is a perfect movie, mm. and it, a very obscure rock documentary called New York Doll. Have you seen New York Doll? I love it. I've seen it. And it's it's about a uh, you know this member of the New York Dolls who, you know, he, well he worked at the Mormon Church mm. I don't, and in the genealogy department and was called back by Morrissey to play, mm. and he's he has to borrow. They fly him to London. He has to hawk his guitar out of hawk uh, and to play with his band for the first time in years. Has to borrow the bellman in the hotel's jacket because it has epaulets on it to perform. And he just plays once, one last time before he dies, just for the love of playing music. Yeah, it's, that's and it's, 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 it's so beautiful and heartbreaking at the same time. Um, I recommend you. Davis, did you have some other Twitter questions we should work in? While we sure. Um, from um, the creative type, this is his name. On a scale of one to ten, how realistic was it? Was was a possible breakup uh, during the making of Octum Baby? Uh, very. Yeah. Um, very. Uh, Nine and ten. <laughs> Very is Irish for nine. <laughs> I think more than a, a kind of dramatic uh, crash and burn uh, during the making of the album, I think what was really at stake was the end of the trust that bound the four of us together. And I think that would have been a slow kind of spiraling down. So I think um, it was pretty close, but that's how I'm sure it would have gone, rather than you know, somebody storming out and breaking up the band. But in a, in a weird way, that probably would have been more sad. That would have led to, would have led to, to the end of the band. Um, we have one from Rebel T3I. Is Edge a perfectionist? Oh, yeah. Um, I try and be a perfectionist, but I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> <laughs> it, it has to be said that, you know, without this uh, extraordinary talent um, that I'm sitting beside, there's nothing here, really. And because he has found a place for the three of us to, he's orchestrated 
the rest of the band and and found a place where my voice fits where Larry's drums and Adam's bass fit and and has really he, he, if you don't mind me saying this um be, because guitar players tend to be blues based you know it's like white guys stealing blues riffs turning and putting them through through amplifier that he kind of invented something and you know uh, you know, you think of painters, and some painters own a color, like Van Gogh owns that color um, uh, yellow, and Eve Klein blue, and all the rest of it. Well, I think in the spectrum um, of music, there's certain tones and feelings that Edge owns, and that is a that's a remarkable thing to, to that there were there's emotions that hadn't been expressed, those emotions hadn't been expressed before. Uh, it, it by a music group, and that's him. Well, thank you. That's very sweet. I, I think it's true to Don't say that um, my guitar playing is absolutely a product of being in the presence of these three guys for the last <clears throat> number of years, and I absolutely wouldn't play the way I play if it wasn't for their influences. No, no way. I mean, I help with the tuning and stuff. <laughs> uh, here's an interesti a very interesting question from Valerie, if you were to release a single from Octum Baby in today's music world, in today's music world, which would fit best in, in, the, in the current music? Even better than the real thing. And there's a mix of it, which is stunning. Uh, Deck Chair Remix, I, think, I don't know what's, uh, uh, what the team is called. Fish Out of Water Remix, which I would like to release as a single. I'm trying to talk some people into it even today. It, and, and it has the Damon Hurst uh, thing. So c Damon did it, his work to that mix. And that's the one we, we opened the, an end of film with. I think that's really happening. We've got about five minutes left. Uh, Davis, I had a question for you. Uh, you've made films like An Inconvenient Truth and Waiting for Superman that are you know, big controversial topics. And then you've made music films like this, uh, like From the Sky Down. What's what's that like moving between those two genres uh, of of sorts? It's, es it's essential. I mean, I, 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 these guys are so modest. You know, you know, you think that you know. After with 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 Octoon Baby, the fans really wanted. You know, streets have no name. You know, and with or without, they wanted, and and you said when you when you even when you first toured uh, on Zuropa that the you've played the first six songs from Octum Baby and the audience, seven, the, the audience was, you know, th these guys, were, what's, what's fascinating about this band, this great band, is that they really <coughs> believe in reinvention and pushing themselves. And, uh, and that's, and, and, and there are other great bands that I think stay in a very specific safe range. And, um, and um, to me as a filmmaker, you know, uh, to, to say, well, what if instead of making a film about the electric guitar, let's bring in three different people, and I've never seen that before. And so to keep changing is great. Do you take perverse delight in taking these very obscure subjects? I mean, I know the edge, and you just heard me rhapsodize him. But I thought three guitar players, a feature-length film. How? could you do that? Global warming, how could you do that? Education system in, in, in the United States. How, you, is, it, is, it a, is that your tickle? Is like really, do you sort of wake up, look in the mirror and go, I'm gonna think of something now really difficult to do. And what, what is it? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I like a good, I don't like feeling safe. I don't. Um, when I finish a day of shooting and I'm driving home and I go, wow, I really knew what I was doing today. <laughs> and boy, I really nailed that. That's, the, that's, when, that's when I should be very scared. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's that feeling of not knowing what you're doing and, and panic that it won't work out that is the most exciting. That once you start to manage that, it's, it's a horrible feeling, but when you manage that, I'm sure it's true, uh, then you realize that there's something unique and good and that makes you grow. We, we tell all our junior engineers when we're in the studio that the times when you're absolutely sure that you should be recording the band 
you probably shouldn't bother. The times when you're pretty much sure that you shouldn't be recording the band, you should definitely be ready to put the machine into record because that's when something great is going to happen. And it's out of the blue, unexpected, and not at all in when you know the official red light goes on for us to perform a take. Often, that's really not very interesting. Yeah. So I mean, that's you know, that's. Davis, is, is, it, what are the what are the questions you still have for the band uh, after having been through this process? Do you like me? <laughs> 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 uh, yes. Yeah, that's a strong word. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's not get carried away here. Oh, uh, I was feeling comfortable. Fuck. <laughs> We'll let that hang. Uh, <laughs> uh, we do uh, need to uh, wrap up, but uh, as I said it before, uh, we couldn't be more proud to show this film. Uh, thank you guys here so much. For, uh, Is there yeah. anyone here? Yeah. Just we'll take we'll take one question since Bono asked. It's a strange thing, yeah, people uh, play one at their weddings. And uh, I mean, I really don't mean this um, Just in any... Just no one listens to lyrics. <laughs> That's really what that shows. Right. I, it, it just, I would just counsel people before they, uh, uh, before they make that uh, choice. Because um, it's a bitter pill, that song. Um, and it's been used in it's strange, and it was it was it, it connected in South Africa, connected in Bosnia, it connects uh, with uh, people fighting for uh, gay rights. David Wanarovich, he died. He gave us his artwork for the, when we put it out. Um, it, it it seems to have connected in so many levels. Um, singing it now, um, I don't know. Um, some nights it catches catches me. Um, uh, some nights we just, you know, get it, you know, just play it. Um, but things change. It is, it, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I was asking the question to myself why we might have agreed to this film, having spent our whole life consciously ignoring anything we did yesterday, let alone 10 or 20 years ago. And I think that we agreed to this because we're at that moment again where we, you two has dodged being irrelevant. Well, you two's been on the verge of irrelevance for the last 20 years. Dodged, ducked, dived, made some great work. <clears throat> A hope along the way and occasional faux pas, but this moment now, where we're at, for me, feels like really close to the edge of our relevance. And, and we can be successful, and we can play, you know, the big music in big places, but whether we can, whether we can play this small music, meaning for small speakers of the radio or the clubs or where people are living right now, remains to be seen. And I think we have to, we have to go, you know, to that place again and if, if, we, if really, if we are to, to survive. You're going to have to come back in 20 years uh, for the next <laughs> film uh, to see that. I have to be on stage in 15 minutes, so <coughs> thank you very much, guys. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Tom.